Brethren, today I want to speak directly to you on the subject of mercy, taken from the parable series of the workers in the vineyard from Matthew chapter 20. Starting in verse 1, the Bible tells us, For the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is a householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right I will give you. And they went out their way. Again he went out about the sixth and ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing idle and saith unto them, Why stand ye here all day idle? They saith unto him, Because no man hath hired us. He saith unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. So when even was come, the Lord of the vineyard said unto his steward, Call the laborer and give them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first. And when they came that were hired about the eleventh hour, they received every man a penny. But when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more, and they likewise received every man a penny. And when they had received it, they murmured against the good man of the house, saying, These last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst not thou agree with me for a penny? Take that thine is, and go thy way. I will give unto this last, even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Is thy eye evil, because I am good? So the last shall be first, and the first last. For many be called, but few chosen. Father, I do pray that you will give us ears to hear what the Spirit says to the church. Today and going forward, every day of our lives, that you see fit in your mercy to give us. Help us to be an example of the mercy we have received from you as we show it unto others for their good and for your glory. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Brethren, you know many times at political meetings, uh, they'll invite a preacher or chaplain or someone uh, to offer a devotional. Now, I'm sure this parable has been preached or taught on or spoken about before in such meetings. Today, in 2021, the Democratic Socialist, also known as the Democratic Party, would say that Jesus was a good socialist and that he would have voted for the left. They would say he's a minimum wage guy quality for everyone. And so these are socialist principles after all. And so uh, Jesus, they would say, must have been a socialist. And yet with the same parable, the Republicans would say this parable proves that Jesus would vote right and not left. Uh, he would be a capitalist, certainly not a socialist. No trade unions, a boss who can hire and fire as he wishes and who settles the issue of wages. 
And so the parable supports capitalistic principles. And you can just hear that, can't you? So which way would Jesus actually vote? What do you suppose? Well, the answer is neither one. Neither one. You see, each of the parties, like so many do, uh, would pick out bits and pieces they agree with and conveniently leave out whatever they didn't agree with. But when you read God's word and you see how the Lord Jesus dealt with parables in order to teach us a deeper heavenly meaning, a deeper spiritual truth while using earthly examples, as in this parable, brethren, you must look at the entire context. The entire context. So what was the parable really about? Well, if we do like many and selfishly apply an interpretation like some truly do, we could assume for us that it's okay on the next day Rather than show up at the hiring office at, say, 8 a.m., we arrive at 4.30 p.m. and expect to be paid a day's 9 to 5 wage. No, that's not the meaning of the parable at all, is it? No. Just imagine, just imagine if you can, the boss goes out at 7 a.m., 7.30 or, say, 8 a.m., etc., and no one's there. He goes out at 2 p.m. and no one's there. 4 p.m.? Still, no one's there. But he shows up at 4.30 p.m. and he notices there's a long line that's developed a mile long of people expecting to get a day's wage for a half hour's work. Now let's assume you worked for a whole week. You worked hard. And then the boss hired someone else on Friday afternoon. And they worked only that Friday afternoon. And suppose that when you both open your paychecks in your paycheck envelope at, let's just say, 5.01 p.m. on Friday, that you both have the exact same wages. Now, how would you feel? Would you say, hallelujah, congratulations, you've got as much money as I have, and you only work one afternoon. Oh, I am so happy for you. Is that how you feel? I don't think so. I don't think so, at least not for the majority of people. No, you'd probably grumble, and you'd probably say something that you often hear little children say when they don't get what they think they deserve, which is, that's not fair, right? That's not fair. Now, brethren, we don't have to teach children how to be selfish. We don't have to teach them how to be cruel. But it takes a lifetime to teach them to be thankful. To teach them to be kind. We don't have to teach them how to be rude or to lie. But with great effort. Parents, I hope you're hearing me. With great effort, we have to teach our children to be polite and to be truthful. But children seem to as naturally and quickly learn to say it's not fair, don't they, as much as adults do. You know, people, some people at least go on saying that all the way through their entire lives. I once heard from a pastor and he shared with me that he received a call from a hospital priest and the priest had visited uh, someone who was sick, who wasn't interesting in talking to the priest, but said that he wanted a pastor. And so this priest called my friend and said, hey, we've got a patient that wants to talk to a pastor. Could you come? And so he said, sure, I'll come. And when he arrived in the room, he said he noticed just how elderly the gentleman was. And he asked him, uh, sir, why did you want to see a pastor? And the man asked him this question. He asked him why God had done this to him. Why, why me? And so my friend said, what's God done to you, sir? 
He said, well, I'm in the hospital. My friend said, well, you, have you ever been in a hospital before? And the gentleman said, never. He said, well, tell me what's going on. And the gentleman said to him, I've lived an upright life. I've tried to do my best. Why would God put me in the hospital? And so he asked him, he said, well, how old are you, sir? And he said, well, I'm 94 years old. And he said, are you telling me you're 94 and you've never, ever, not once been in a hospital? And again, the gentleman said, no. He went on to tell him about what a good life he had lived. And so the pastor asked him, well, how long are you going to be in here? And he was told 10 days. Then he asked him again, why has God done this to me? With his face all scrunched up. Like my children when they were two and three years old with the explanation of, it's not fair. You have that image in your mind, brethren? Does it sound familiar? We've seen that kind of expression before, haven't we? Not just on little children, but on the faces of workers on strike. We've seen it on the faces of so many adults going through their entire lives saying, why has God done this to me? I don't deserve this. This is not fair. Why? Why did my candidate not get elected? Why did my parents get divorced? Why didn't I get that job I was more than qualified for? Why has God given me cancer? Why, why, why has God done this to me? And every time someone asks that question, what they're really saying is he's not fair. Now, let me ask you a question about the man in this parable in Matthew chapter 20. Do you think he was fair? Or maybe to put it another way, do you think he was more or less than fair in the way that he treated his workers? Brethren, I want to declare to you this, that he was actually more than fair. He wasn't less than fair. He was at a very minimum fair because he gave everyone a living wage enough to live on and he paid everyone a wage that was agreed upon. So the people who'd worked all day had no right to grumble because he wasn't being less than fair to them. He told them what he paid them and he paid them. To those who only worked a little while, he was actually more than fair. So this boss was more than fair, not less than fair. And brethren, listen to me. God himself, God himself is never less than fair. You see, God is always fair. He's a God of justice, and so he's under an obligation to himself to pay everyone what they are owed. If to prove a point, if God paid us all, only what we deserved, only what we deserved, then brethren, this Bible study today would not be happening. I wouldn't be talking to you. Because if God gave me what I deserved, I wouldn't be alive. And there isn't any one of us who if God actually gave us what we deserved, that we'd be here at all. And that's the truth. It is of God's mercy, of his mercy, that we're here at all. And that's the truth. The prophet Jeremiah said, it is of the Lord's mercies that we're not consumed because his compassions fail not. His mercies are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. 
That's from Lamentations chapter 3, verses 22 through 24. Brethren, I'm thankful for God's mercies. His mercies that are new every morning, which remind me that he gives me more than I deserve. And he's more than fair. You know, I'm 49 years old and I'm still alive. And that's a mercy, brethren. Put your age in the blanks and the answer is the same. It is a mercy of God. Everything we have in this life is a mercy of God. There's no merit, only mercy, because the only thing, again, we deserve is God's punishment. We deserve his wrath. We deserve his anger. We deserve hell and his justice. Now, brethren, are you not thankful? Are you not thankful that God doesn't just deal with you based on what you actually deserve? That would be terrible. That would be a horror. But in and on the basis of God's mercy, he is more than fair. There was a famous man who once had his portrait painted by an artist. The man said to the artist, I sure hope this portrait will do me some justice. And the artist replied, sir, it's not justice you need, but mercy. <laughs> I say amen to that because there is a big difference. There's an eternal difference, in fact, between justice and mercy. And yet God is both. He is both. And you know, anyone who exercises mercy, anyone who exercises mercy, it's entirely up to them who they show mercy to. Now give that some thought. And why is that so important to know? Because God Almighty is under his own holy obligation to give everyone justice. But listen, he does not show mercy to everyone. And he won't. He won't. In fact, among people in my neighborhood at this very moment, where I live today, some will have God's mercy, while others will not. Because God will choose. Exodus chapter 33 and verse 19 says, I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. Romans 9 and verse 15 again, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. So brethren, God will choose who he gives mercy to. God will choose who he gives mercy to. And so brethren, we're faced with really an important question, which is what I wanted to get to. How does God choose? It's so important for us to know so that we may have and receive his mercy, right? It's not about luck, that's for sure. It's not like some raffle ticket, whether you get mercy or not, but you know, many people actually think it is. They go to a meeting and hear about Jesus' healing and they think, well, I wonder if it's my time. I wonder if my number's been picked out of the lottery basket. And you know what? That's a slander upon God because there's no such thing as luck in the kingdom of God. So can we answer the question, how does God choose whom to give mercy to? I believe we can. I want to give you at least three principles of God in answering that question today. Number one, listen, and you should write this down. Number one, God shows his mercy to those who ask for it. 
God shows his mercy to those who ask for it. Sounds simple, doesn't it? Yeah, that's the truth. Do you get up in the morning seeking God's mercy? When you pray, do you ask him for his mercy? Strange thing is, I've heard so many prayers in my lifetime, and rarely, rarely have I heard prayers for mercy. And yet God is full of mercy. He awaits for sinners to ask him for it. Hebrews 4 and verse 16, Therefore, let us come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Ephesians 2, verses 4 and 5. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are you saved. And there's verse after verse after verse speaking about God showing his mercy to those who ask for it. Psalm 51, Titus 3, Micah 7, 2 Chronicles 30. The Bible is replete. Brethren, listen though. I've heard so many prayers for good health, for finances, relationships, peace, etc., but why so few prayers for mercy? Why so few prayers for mercy? I believe the answer is this. We don't feel that we're bad enough, sinful enough to need God's mercy. I've heard prayers for mercy in prisons coming from the hearts of inmates convicted, not by a jury, but by the Holy Ghost. I've heard prayers for mercy by parents pleading the blood of Christ over a wayward son or daughter. But rarely, rarely, especially in church gatherings, with so many dignified Christians, have I ever heard prayers or pleas for God's mercy. Because so many simply think they're too good to ask for it. Which, brethren, to me, only proves they are the ones most in need of God's mercy. Again, God shows his mercy to those who ask for it. Have you asked for God's mercy today? Brethren, I pray you will because God is full of mercy. He's a merciful God. You know, Jesus told another parable in Luke chapter 18. Uh, just turn, turn with me there for a moment. Luke chapter 18, I'll turn there to uh, starting in verse 10. Luke 18 and verse 10. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let's, let's look at verses 10 through 14. The Bible says two men went up into the temple, Jesus speaking to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus within himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week, I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus said, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. That old Pharisee sounded a lot like Satan did when he said, I will exalt my throne above the stars of heaven. I will be like the most high God. 
And yet what did the Lord say in response? No, no, you'll not. You'll be brought down as this Pharisee Jesus referred to being abased. You'll be brought down by God to the sides of the pit. Self-centered, I, I, I. Can you imagine? Now just think about this for a minute. Can you imagine this man, this publican Jesus referred to in this parable, this tax collecting extortioner going home to his wife and his wife asks him, where you been? At the temple. You? What were you doing? Blackmailing the priest? No. Praying. You? Pray? Yes. You haven't prayed in the 40 years we've been married and you think God heard you? He did. And things, everything, in fact, is going to be different now. Brethren, just imagine that. And all that man did was to ask for mercy. And why did Jesus mention him in this way? Because he got it. Because he got it. Oh, brethren, there's much to learn about asking God for mercy. Now, some of you history buffs may remember the Nuremberg trials. At the end of World War II, Nazi leaders were put on trial for the murder of millions of people, including over six million Jews. And they were offered two things, a lawyer to defend them and a chaplain to look after their souls. Of approximately 30 Nazi men, five requested a Catholic priest and 16 wanted a Lutheran pastor. Now they searched for a Lutheran pastor to look after their souls and they found a chaplain in all places among the U.S. Air Force personnel named Gerica. Now Gerica was the grandson of German immigrants to the U.S. and so he spoke German. When he was asked if he would look after the souls of these Nazis, he said, never. The Nazis killed my boys, referring to the men in his unit. But God said, Gerica, you go. And so the next Sunday morning at Nuremberg jail, he found himself preaching to some of the worst men in Germany. He told them about Jesus's life, death, burial and resurrection the gospel. He spoke and preached to men with names that you may be familiar with if you're a history student. Uh, Keitel, Ribbentrop, Ryder, Speer, Fritsch, von Schirach, Salko, Gehring. These are names you may remember from history. Infamous names. Gehrig went on to write in his journal the following. Saukul was the first to open his heart to the gospel. He was the father of 10 children and had a Christian wife. After a few visits, we knelt down together by his bed and he prayed, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And I know he was perfectly sincere. Then Fritsch, Von Schirach and Speer asked for permission to receive communion. Ryder, Keitel, and others, one after another of these Nazi war criminals, asked God for mercy and got it. There were two who would not listen to the gospel. One was Hermann Goering, and the other was Rudolf Hess. Hess hanged himself, and Gearing took poison. And just before that, uh, Gearing's 
wife and daughter had come to say goodbye to him. The little girl said, Daddy, please put your faith in Jesus. I want to see you in heaven. And Gearing just pushed her out of his way and said, You believe in your way, and I'll believe in mine. And an hour later, he was dead and in hell. All these other men did was to ask God for mercy. And they got it. Brethren, how do you feel about that? Now some have gotten angry, saying, why should they receive mercy? But brethren, that's what God is like. And his ways are higher than ours. It's like the question I've been asked, I don't know how many times in ministry, the question of, uh, Dr. Smith, why do bad things happen to good people? Have you ever asked that question yourself or been asked that question by others? Well, my response is the same. The premise of the question is wrong. You might say, well, why is that? Because there is none good. There, the Bible says there is none good but God. Remember that. Remember that. Lest you be carried away with a false sense of self-righteousness. God forbid. Number two, the second answer to the question of how does God choose whom to show his mercy to is really and equally simple, but searching. And it's this. God will show mercy to those who will pass mercy on to others. To those who will pass mercy on to others. You know, Jesus himself said, <clears throat> excuse me, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Mercy. It's Matthew 5 and verse 7. And Jesus told another parable about a man who owed a king something like, in today's money, a billion dollars in currency. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 18 for just a moment together. Matthew chapter 18. So let's go back to Matthew and look at Matthew chapter 18. Starting in verse 23. Matthew 18, starting in verse 23. Jesus said, Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him ten thousand talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshiped him saying, Lord, have patience with me and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants which owed him a hundred pence. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Shouldst not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant? 
even as I had pity on thee. And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses. Wow. Brethren, listen to me. Unforgiveness towards others is a huge barrier to God's mercy. It is a huge barrier to God's mercy. If God's mercy cannot flow out from you to others, why would you ever expect God's mercy to flow into you? Just think about that for a moment. God will show mercy to those who will pass mercy on to others. Brethren, that's worthy of our contemplation and prayer as much as anything else that we're dealing with today. Amen? Well, let's move to number three. How does God choose to whom he shows mercy to? Those who don't exploit it. Those who don't take advantage of it. Again, sounds simple, but it's true. Suppose you're going for a walk, let's say by Lake Norman. Those of you who live here in the Carolinas, and you see a man, he's drowning and he's screaming, save me, help me. And you jump in, you pull him to safety. And as you both stand there on the bank, he reaches out his hand to shake yours and says, Oh, thank you so much. You saved my life. And then the man turns around and jumps back in the lake, splashing and screaming once again, save me, help me. And what do you do? You jump in, you save him again, pulling him back safely to shore. He looks at you and he says again, oh, I'm just, I'm doubly thankful to you. That's twice now you've saved me before you can even say a word. He jumps right back in. Now, brethren, we might even laugh at that for a moment, but listen. Unfortunately, you've done it. And so have I. If we've come to the Lord telling him about the mess we've made, and six months later, we jump right back into that mess. That's exploiting or taking advantage of God's mercy. And his message to us is simple. Stop it. Stop it. Just as he said to the woman against whom they were about to take up stones to stone her to death, As he forgave her all her sins, he left these words as a mark upon her heart. Go and sin no more. No more. Stop it. Brethren, it is so important for us to understand the accountability that comes when God does show us mercy, that we don't exploit it or take advantage of it. There once was a little boy who was playing with some older boys, and one of the older boys came up as they were playing ball in the neighborhood and popped him in the back of the head with his hand, just being a bit of a bully. Well, it hurt, and the little fellow went to the curb and sat down, and he was crying, and sobbing and the older boy was troubled and said come on man I was I was just picking and the little boy said are you sorry and the older 
little boy said, yes, I'm sorry. And I find what he said so interesting and connected to this last part. He looked at him and he asked him the question, are you sorry enough not to ever do it again? Brethren, are you sorry enough to go and sin no more? This study, at the very least for me, has been convicting to my soul. We must look at God's mercy for what it is. Something that can only come from Him. And it comes to those who ask for it. It comes to those who pass it on to others. It comes to those who will not exploit it for advantage. Brethren, the one thing we need most is God's mercy because without it, we would be consumed. We would be consumed. Father, thank you for granting us your mercy. The mercy that comes to us through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. We praise you for it and for him. In Jesus' name.